Thank you once again, uh, Professor Bargu, for agreeing to join us for the um, uh, workshop um, and um, especially uh, present on, on this very interesting topic of algorithmic price discrimination. Um, Professor Bargu probably uh, does not require much uh, introduction, but I would still like to say a couple of words. Um, and Professor Bargil is um, a professor of law and economics at the Harvard University. Uh, prior to joining Harvard University, he was also a professor of law and economics at uh, the New York University uh, School of Law. And we have a privilege to have him as, as a final speaker of our event, uh, um, as a person who has background in both law and economics, uh, in, in which uh, uh, he holds uh, the degrees in both disciplines uh, from Tel Aviv University and from Harvard University. And um, Professor Bargu also serves uh, as a reporter for restatement of law consumer contracts at the American uh, Law Institute. So the um, um, background in also consumer questions here is, uh, is, is very uh, relevant. Uh, and this is uh, visible also from, from his uh, broad scholarship, uh, which focuses on law and economics of contracts, uh, and uh, including consumer contracts. Uh, the, um, Professor Bargu is an um, author of uh, many influential publications, including a monograph, uh, Seduction by Contract, Law, Economics and Psychology in Consumer Markets, and more recently, the author of a paper, uh, among others, on uh, algorithmic price discrimination, when demand is a function of uh, both uh, preferences and uh, misperception, which was published uh, in the University of Chicago Law Review, and which I believe is going to be also the topic of, of the talk today. So uh, once again, many thanks for, for joining us today, and um, um, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this workshop. Um, and, and thank you for everyone who stayed till, uh, till the very end. So um, as Agnieszka mentioned, this uh, talk is gonna be about algorithmic price discrimination and the focus is going to be on the question of what demand is actually made of. Is it a function only of preferences or also of misperceptions? So in a nutshell, what I want to do in this, uh, in this presentation is to compare the standard neoclassical model of price discrimination to an alternative behavioral model. In the standard model, willingness to pay, which is the stuff that demand curves are made of, okay, the amount that a consumer is willing to pay for a certain good or a service, is basically a function of the consumer's preferences. And in this neoclassical model, when economists look at the welfare implications of price discrimination, okay, they say that the welfare implications are ambiguous. On the one hand, we know that price discrimination hurts consumers, but on the other hand, it increases efficiency. And so depending on what you care about uh, in your normative theory, then price discrimination can be either bad, but it can also be good. In the behavioral model, where willingness to pay is a function of both the preferences and potential misperceptions of consumers, the results, as I will show, are quite different. The harm to consumers first is much larger. And on the other hand, the countervailing efficiency benefit is much smaller. Indeed, there could be an efficiency harm, a reduction in efficiency from price discrimination. And so we will see that there is a much stronger justification for legal intervention, for policy intervention under the behavioral model, intervention in or against price discrimination. So let me start with the relationship between our price discrimination and willingness to pay. The first thing to note is that price discrimination can be very profitable to sellers, and that's why sellers try very hard to get information about willingness to pay, the willingness to pay of different consumers, and to use that information to price discriminate, to charge higher prices for consumers who are willing to pay more and lower prices for consumers who are willing to pay less. Okay, and so the key is that for sellers, to be able to price discriminate, they need to know the willingness to pay of different buyers. And, and this is where the question of data, big data, and algorithms comes in. The availability of data and the algorithms that use this data allows sellers to price discriminate at a level that was previously not feasible. Okay? So they basically now have willingness to pay information at the individual level. And so I, I like to quote from uh, my colleague at Harvard, Bruce Schneier, who's a cybersecurity expert. And he said, 
You know, I used to say that Google knows more about me than my wife does, but that doesn't go far enough, Schneier says. Okay, just trying to capture the amount of information that these sellers have and therefore their ability to price discriminate almost at the individual level. Okay, so we're now approaching, and you've seen kind of evidence of this I, from the program on this conference, you know, evidence of this um, in, in many, many contexts. We now have the ability to price discriminate at a level that it approximates what economists call first degree price discrimination. So basically setting different prices for each individual consumer. We might not be entirely there, but we're, we're getting there. And this is the model that I, I want to analyze. The next step is deconstructing this idea of willingness to pay, how much consumers willing to pay for a product or a service. And as I mentioned, in the neoclassical economic model, the standard model, willingness to pay is a function of preferences. In the behavioral model, in addition to preferences, there is this idea of perceptions or misperceptions about the value of the product or service that can affect how much a consumer is willing to pay for the product or service. And I'm going to focus on demand inflating these perceptions because, of course, sellers have a lot of incentives to inflate demand for their products. Just to give you an example, be a little bit more concrete. So think about health club subscriptions. Obviously, and this is in the neoclassical model, Okay, the willingness to pay for a health club membership is a function of people's preferences. Okay, and these preferences are based on the benefit that they expect to derive from kind of the health, aesthetic, or status effects of the health club membership. Okay, so these preferences are obviously important and they drive demand, they drive or determine or affect willingness to pay. In the behavioral model, in addition to these preference effects, we also recognize that misperceptions can affect the amount that you're willing to pay. Okay, so imagine you make your kind of New Year's resolution and you are sure that you're going to go to the health club you know, every week, maybe twice a week. Okay, and because you think you're going to make a lot of use of this health club membership, you're willing to pay a lot for it. In fact, you end up going to the health club maybe only twice, twice a month or once a month. And so the benefits that you get, that you actually get are much smaller than what you initially thought. And the idea is, of course, that your willingness to pay and the demand for these products or services are a function of what you think, your perceived benefits, okay, and not only of the actual benefit. Okay, so misperceptions can play an important role in affecting willingness to pay for a very broad range of products and services in consumer markets. Um, again, there are many, many examples. Uh, I won't kind of belabor it because I really want to kind of uh, leave time for questions, but just kind of there are a few kind of examples that are really kind of in your face so through Facebook and Google have these um, cognitive services that they derive from the vast amounts of data that they have, including assessing someone's personality by sifting through their writings. And of course, now we have information about browsing behavior and shopping behavior, and the algorithms can uh, detect, derive information about kind of cognitive behavioral um, elements that are unique to individual uh, uh, consumers. And again, going back to kind of the Schneier claim that Google knows more about Schneier than his wife, obviously my wife knows about, not only about my preferences, she knows also about my different types of kind of cognitive biases and irrationalities. But what is most important perhaps is that when an algorithm works on the data that say Google or Facebook or any other of these kind of major tech giants have, or data that is sold to even smaller uh, sellers. Okay, these algorithms, what they care about is identifying willingness to pay. Most of them don't really care about what the willingness to pay is made of, if it's just preferences, or if it's preferences plus misperceptions. They care about the bottom line, the willingness to pay. But as we will see, the normative assessment of price discrimination okay, depends critically on the composition of the willingness to pay. Okay, so the algorithms look at willingness to pay as long as we know the willingness to pay is a function of both um, uh, preferences and misperceptions, the normative analysis changes. Okay, and so what are our normative questions? Enabled by big data and algorithms, is it good? as the role of misperceptions in the willingness to
a behavioral model. Okay, and so you have the demand curve is in red, the downward sloping demand. What it just means is that when the price is higher, the quantity sold is lower. When the price is lower, the quantity sold is higher. Okay, and of course, this demand curve is an aggregation of the different consumers' willingness to pay. On the supply side, this is kind of the blue curve. I'm assuming for simplicity, a, uh, a horizontal supply curve, which represents fixed per unit cost. Now, in a competitive market, we know that the price will be set at the intersection of supply and demand, right, right here. And therefore, we will have a very large consumer surplus represented by red. Okay, so, so if we have consumers to the left, okay, with very high willingness to pay, they're willing to pay a lot for this product, they actually pay a lower price. And so they gain a lot of surplus. Consumers to the right, okay, they have a lower willingness to pay. Okay, but they still get some surplus because okay? they will always only buy if their willingness to pay is above the price. Okay, and so this red triangle represents the consumer surplus. But of course, if we want to talk about price discrimination, we need to move away from the perfect competition model. Okay, so now look at this alternative model with monopoly. We know that a monopolist is going to set a price that is higher than the competitive price. Okay, and so only consumers who have a willingness to pay above this price are going to buy the product. And so we have this smaller red triangle representing the smaller consumer surplus under monopoly. The seller here is actually going to make a profit because the price charged, the monopoly price is higher than the per unit cost that the seller bears in order to generate this product or service. And so we have the blue, the blue rectangle representing the seller's surplus. And we also need to mention here this black triangle. These are consumers who should buy because their willingness to pay is higher than cost to the seller, but they don't buy because the monopolist sets a high price. This is the famous uh, monopoly deadweight loss. The quantity is too low under monopoly. Okay, now we can finally introduce price discrimination. And what we see in the price discrimination model where the uh, seller with the advantage of big data can actually go down the demand curve, set different prices for different individuals. Okay? Then if I value the product at 100, I will pay 100 or 99. If I value the product at 50, I will pay um, 50 or 49. The seller is able to extract everything. And so if we had a big red triangle under competition, we have this big blue triangle representing all of these seller's surplus under price discrimination. So the seller basically gets everything under price discrimination. So this is bad for consumers. There is no red in this picture, no consumer surplus. But you also see that this is good for efficiency. Okay. The black triangle, the deadweight loss, goes away, does not appear. So we have, you see, both the advantage and disadvantage of price discrimination in the standard neoclassical model. Price discrimination is bad for consumers, but it's good for efficiency. Now we can introduce the behavioral model. Okay, so I'm now adding overestimation of demand, okay, demand inflating misperceptions to the standard model. Okay, so we now have this uh, perceived demand and a broken red line, okay? And it is above the actual benefit of 100 from the health club. They think that the benefit is 20. And the consumer who has an actual benefit of 50 thinks it's 60, okay? And so we have this uh, higher demand curve because of the misperception, because of the overestimation. Now, what does this mean? It means that now we're going to have a group of consumers okay, who are buying this product because they think that their benefit, okay, they think that their benefit is higher than the price, but in fact, it is lower. The actual benefit, the actual demand curve is lower. And so we have this triangle over here, which represents efficiency loss. These are consumers who are buying and should not be buying. Okay? They buy because of the uh, overestimation. Okay? And this is in the competition set now moving on to the monopoly situation okay again we have the higher demand curve, which means that the monopolist will set a higher price okay this also means again that the amount uh the, the consumer surplus will be lower fewer consumers will buy 
Okay, but you also see that again, we have this group of consumers who are buying when they should not be buying at the higher monopoly price. Okay, and so these consumers are actually losing money. Not only are they not gaining, they're actually losing money. But anything that the consumer loses, the sellers are gaining. Okay, because the seller gets all this difference between the price, the monopoly price, and the per unit cost. You also see, by the way, that the deadweight loss goes down because of the perception. Okay, so overestimation of demand in an interesting way kind of offsets the insufficient quantity problem under a monopoly. Okay, so this is monopoly without price discrimination. Now, what happens when we add price discrimination fueled by big data and algorithmic pricing? Okay, we have the following. We have this higher demand curve. And now the monopolist is able to go down the perceived demand curve and charge higher prices. Okay, so if I think that I get 110 out of this health club membership, well, in fact, I get 100. But if I think I get 110, the monopolist can charge me 110. Okay, and if I think that I'm going to get 60 rather than the actual 50, the monopolist can charge me the 60. Okay, and so we have now the monopolist making a lot of money. The blue triangle goes is much larger, going all the way up to here. Okay, but now look at the effects on consumers. Okay, first of all, note that consumers are not only gaining nothing, which is what we had in the neoclassical model, they're actually losing substantial amounts of money. Okay, they're actually paying 110 for something that's worth 100, or they're paying 60 for something that's only worth 50. So this purple um, you know, parallelogram here, if you will, or trapezoid, represents the um, amount of money that consumers actually lose, consumers in this range. On top of that, moving on to efficiency, we see again this triangle here representing the consumers who are buying because of the misperception and should not be buying. Okay? And it's not only uh, a reduction in consumer surplus, this is an efficiency loss. Okay, so in the standard model, the price discrimination led to an efficiency gain okay, as compared to monopoly. Here we have an efficiency loss. And depending on the relative size of this efficiency loss and the black triangle, okay, the deadweight loss under monopoly without price discrimination, we could really, it can really happen that price discrimination actually increases efficiency. Okay, and in any event, it is much less attractive than it was in the neoclassical model. And in the neoclassical model, one willingness to pay is a function of preferences alone, and price discrimination hurts consumers but increases efficiency. When willingness to pay is a function of both preferences and misperceptions. Okay, in the behavioral model, price discrimination hurts consumers even more and may also reduce efficiency. And so, as I mentioned, this suggests that there is more room to consider policy implications. Okay, there's more room for legal intervention um, because price discrimination is more harmful. And we can think about different types of policy interventions. And I've just raised these as possibilities and questions. I'm not uh, arguing or advocating for any particular type of legal intervention. So, if price discrimination is harmful, perhaps we should just prohibit price discrimination. That's one possibility. Another possibility is to facilitate market forces that interfere with price discrimination, like making arbitrage easier or disseminating information that could trigger a fairness-based consumer backlash. And I've seen in the program that there is papers that are coming on as well. Another possibility is to attack the foundation of algorithmic price discrimination, namely big data. Okay, so if we think about um, increasing privacy protections and data security measures, and this would limit the amount of data that sellers have, and therefore limit their ability to price discriminate in a harmful way, then this might be a new uh, additional justification for these privacy protections and data security measures. A final set of implications that I just want to kind of throw out there is the notion of personalized pricing or personalized disclosure. What we've seen now is that sellers are able to set prices that are personalized. If I have a higher willingness to pay, they'll set a higher price for me. If I have somebody else has a lower willingness to pay, they'll set a lower willingness, willingness sorry, uh, lower price for that person. Okay? And so if sellers can vary their prices based on the individual characteristics, 
okay, then maybe also regulators can set price caps, okay, regulate prices in an individualized way. Okay, so this is another uh, idea that we can throw out there. Personalized disclosure, giving consumers personalized information about their misperceptions, okay, might also be a, a solution or response to the problems identified here. Before I end, let me just mention a few extensions. Um, one possible extension has to do with correlated misperceptions. Have you seen in kind of the, the simple graphs that I showed you, uh, um, perceived demand curve was just an upward shift from the um, actual demand curve, but it doesn't have to be an upward shift. It can you know, rotate in different ways, okay? So that you might have larger misperceptions when your price base to pay is higher, okay? Or lower misperceptions when your preference based willingness to pay is lower. So the correlation between perception and preference based willingness to pay can lead to other uh, interesting um, uh, refinements to the analysis. It's also interesting to think about demand deflating misperceptions, which is reasonable in some markets. We can talk about that if you're interested. We can talk about quality discrimination or personalized quality price combinations, in addition to the price discrimination that the analysis um, in this presentation is focused on. We can also think about labor markets and wage discrimination okay, as a corollary to the uh, analysis of consumer markets and price discrimination. And so with this, I'll conclude, and I think I'm right on the 20 minute mark. In the behavioral model, where willingness to pay is a function of both preferences and misperception, uh, price discrimination is more harmful, and therefore there is a stronger reason to consider legal interventions, policy interventions, and kind of, we can talk about a bunch of these typical interventions. So I will end here and I look forward to your questions.